Hello, everyone. My name is Andam Gebregorgis, and I'm really excited to be joining this amazing panel of experts to discuss um, imperialism and militarism in the Sahel and East Africa. I am a proud member of DSA and the Eritrean Justice Organization One Day Soon, um, and this is a really important conversation that we're going to be having. The United States is escalating its military presence in Africa with the construction of new bases, drone facilities, and the CIA and the Pentagon are really conducting operations with little to no public scrutiny. I think back to uh, the 2017 uh, attack in Niger on U.S. soldiers. And for many people, the reaction here in the States was, wait, we have troops in Niger, if they even have heard of Niger. France also and other major powers are increasing their presence to combat terrorism and protect what it regards as its own strategic resources. The militarization and conflict, it perpetuates in and around the Sahara has created extremely dire circumstances for the people of the region and creating a major barrier to working class organizing on the continent. So as I said, I'm really looking forward to the conversation with the panel of experts we have, Samar al-Balushi, Brittany Mache, and Alex Thurston, so we can understand the growing imperialist interventions in the Sahel and East Africa and how to fight them. We're first going to start with Samar al-Balushi, and she's an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Irvine. Her research is broadly concerned with surveillance, militarism, and policing in the context of the so-called war on terror in East Africa. Samar is a contributing editor at Africa as a Country, and her work has appeared in many places, including The Guardian, Al Jazeera, um, Intercepted, and more. So, Samar, we're so fortunate to have you. Um, take it away. Thanks so much, Andom, and thank you all for being here today. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have. So I'm going to be starting uh, by focusing on Somalia and more broadly on East Africa. Um, as many of us know, Somalia has been the site of a U.S.-led undeclared war for almost 15 years now. It was under the Bush administration that Somalia became a source of quote-unquote concern. But the U.S. government had no intention of placing troops on the ground at the time. Instead, it invoked the language of partnership and sought to garner support from allies on the continent who would be ready to deploy troops to the front lines. Ethiopia was the first to step up as a quote unquote partner and with US support, the Ethiopian military invaded Somalia in December of 2006. And in doing so, they dislodged the first stable government that Somalia had had in several years. It was during the Obama administration that a significant U.S. drone and airstrike campaign began, coupled with the deployment of U.S. special operations forces inside the country. And keep in mind that the U.S. has never declared official war on Somalia, right? When Trump came into power, he signed a directive that instituted war zone targeting rules by expanding the discretionary authority of the military to conduct airstrikes in the country. During Trump's time in office, southern Somalia became the target of an unprecedented escalation of drone strikes, with approximately 900 to 1,000 people killed between 2016 and 2019, and tens of thousands of people displaced. Last year, in the first four months of 2020 alone, the U.S. launched more drone strikes in Somalia than it did during Barack Obama's entire eight-year term in office. Now, all of this has been widely documented um, by groups like Air Wars, Amnesty International, among others. But the U.S. Military Command for Africa, which is better known as AFRICOM, has either failed to report civilian casualties or painted all of these uh, people as quote unquote terrorists. We now have a growing understanding of what AFRICOM looks like in practice, logistics hubs, forward operating sites, cooperative security locations. These are all infrastructures that facilitate militarism and war across the continent and beyond, including places like Yemen. What I want to emphasize today is that AFRICOM is situated within and often reliant upon less scrutinized war-making infrastructures that also claim to operate in the name of security. So it's important to pay attention to the wider matrix of militarized violence that's at work. There are all kinds of actors on the ground that sustain the, US, the U.S.'s war-making apparatus in the region, including private security companies and African militaries and police. And 
for me, I have found that uh, the work of two scholar activists uh, has been especially helpful as I process these dynamics. The first is Madiha Taher, who's a scholar and independent journalist who reminds us that attack drones are only the most visible element of what she refers to as distributed empire, wherein a whole range of actors and infrastructures are mobilized to expand the reach of imperial warfare. I also am inspired by the work of Ruth Wilson Gilmore and her analysis of the prison and military industrial complex. Gilmore pushes us to think about the diverse set of actors that converge to produce what she refers to as a machinery of death from intellectuals to politicians to private companies alongside the more obvious entities like the police and the military. And the point that she makes that's so crucial here is that there are many different sites to direct our analysis and ultimately our resistance. I'm gonna tell you about two different events separated by a year to illustrate these points. In January of last year in 2020, Al-Shabaab launched an attack on a U.S. military base in northeastern Kenya. This attack was unprecedented because until that point, Al-Shabaab had never attacked a military site within Kenya. Until that point, most of its attacks had been, in fact, all of its attacks had been on civilian spaces with the 2013 Nairobi Westgate Mall uh, attack as the one that received the most coverage. Now, this particular attack was likely a response to the fact that it's from this military base that AFRICOM launches drone strikes in Somalia. But it was in the wake of this attack that we learned that AFRICOM relies on a private company to gather the aerial surveillance that it needs in order to launch its attacks. So the target was a plane flown by L3 Harris Technologies, a US-based company that won $4 billion in government contracts between 2018 and 2019 alone. That's just one year. So the main point I want to make here is that even if this company is not involved in direct combat, it's part of what's often referred to as the kill chain by helping to gather aerial intelligence needed for drone strikes. So the next event uh, took place exactly a year later in January of 2021. And uh, it was in late January when reports circulated on social media about a suspected drone strike in southern Somalia. Now, the reason this particular drone strike was of great interest is that it took place within the first nine days of the Biden administration. Um, and so the question became, is Biden going to be continuing the Trump era policy of drone strikes? Now, AFRICOM denied responsibility for this particular incident and claimed that the last U.S. military action in Somalia had occurred on January 19th, on the last full day of the Trump presidency. Last month, in March, the New York Times reported that the Biden administration had, in fact, imposed temporary limits on the Trump-era directives, thereby constraining drone strikes outside of, quote-unquote, conventional battlefield zones. So this brings us to the question of who else may have been behind that particular strike. Analysts at Air Wars concluded that the strike was likely carried out by forces from the African Union peacekeeping mission in Somalia, known as AMASOM, and more specifically by Ethiopian troops, because it took place soon after Al-Shabaab fighters had ambushed a contingent of Ethiopian troops in the area. Now, this is not entirely far-fetched, and it could very well make sense. And before I come, I come back to that, I just want to unpack for us a little bit more what is AMASOM. Um, so about a month after the Ethiopian military invaded Somalia, the UN authorized this peacekeeping mission uh, to quote unquote stabilize Somalia. It began as a small deployment of roughly 1,600 troops and then increasingly grew to just over 22,000. It's composed of uh, troops from Uganda, Ethiopia, Burundi, Djibouti, and Kenya. And even though Amazon's initial rules of engagement permitted the use of force only when necessary, it gradually assumed an offensive role engaging in counterinsurgency and counterterror operations. Now, at the same time, some of these troop contributing states have maintained an entirely separate contingent of troops that conduct their own aerial assaults against Al-Shabaab in Somalia. So in 2017, for example, the UN alleged that unauthorized Kenyan airstrikes had contributed to at least 40 civilian deaths in a 22 month period. Last year, the Somali government accused the Kenyan military of indiscriminate bombing. At one point, the Kenyan military reportedly conducted over 50 airstrikes in a two week period. 
And as of this year, the Ugandan military is also launching air assaults in the country. So looking ahead, factoring in these developments, I just want to think uh, about what we might expect from the Biden administration. If there's one thing that we do know, it's that the U.S. empire is constantly reinventing itself and showing up in new guises. As the Biden administration seeks to restore the image of the U.S. abroad, I think it's possible that AFRICOM will gradually assume a backseat role in counterterror operations in Somalia. Relying more heavily on its partners in the region would enable the U.S. to offset the public scrutiny and liability that comes with its own direct involvement. This means, I think, that we need to be attuned to more conventional forms of repressive state violence that are carried out by U.S.-trained, quote-unquote, partner forces. And the fact that the U.S. is working with so many different governments in the region means that we need to be attuned to the reality that this is a war that extends across multiple geographies. In Kenya, for example, U.S.-trained Kenyan police are involved in extrajudicial killings and disappearances of purported terror suspects within the country, and they've also invo been involved in cross-border coordinated forms of police power like rendition, where suspects have been illegally transported to prisons in nearby countries. So as we think about efforts to abolish militarism and end this war in the region, it'll be important to reflect on the fact that this warscape is a terrain that's shaped by diverse and interconnected modes of power and that we distribute our activism accordingly. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Samar. And we'll certainly be talking more about this um, as we go forward in our discussion. But if folks want to check out the review of African political economy, and your article, Kenya, the United States, and the Project of Endless War in Somalia, certainly that's also discussed there as well. We're gonna move on to Brittany, and Brittany Mache is the Gaius Bolin Postdoctoral Fellow in Environmental Studies at Williams College. Brittany earned her PhD in Geography from the University of California, Berkeley, and she's currently writing a book about transnational security regimes, environmental knowledge, and the afterlives of empire in the West African Sahel. Brittany, looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, thank you, Andan, for that very generous introduction. Um, thank you, Samar, for those thoughtful comments. I'm looking forward to being in conversation with you and Alex. Um, so I'll open my comments with a few recent reports just from earlier this month that I think prompt a series of thorny questions for thinking about contemporary militarism in the Sahel. So first, our news reports indicating that 2021 is on track to be the deadliest year for civilians in the Sahel over the last six years. And I'll note here in my comments today, when I'm referring to the Sahel, I'm generally referring to the West African Sahel. So that's broadly the area that stretches from Senegal and Mauritania in the West through to Chad in the East. And this violence against civilians is not just from the kind of usual suspects that are often mentioned vis-a-vis -vis violence in the Sahel. So Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, um, the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. This violence is also committed by local security forces, volunteer militias, community defense forces, UN peacekeeping forces, and French and US forces operating in the region have also been accused of either directly committing crimes against civilians or looking the other way as forces that they've trained commit violence against civilians. Um, and so I want to foreground the human cost of these events alongside what is being heralded as a new orientation for U.S. militarism. So just yesterday, U.S. President Biden announced an official end to the war in Afghanistan, even as critical commentators have rightly interrogated what that end might actually look like. And on April 9th, the U.S. government released its annual threat assessment issued by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And in working through that report, I was struck by kind of in the popular international relations parlance, the, the predominance of great power politics up front. So we get China, we get Iran, we get North Korea, we get Russia. And then at the bottom of the pack in a section entitled conflicts and instability, we get Africa broadly listed last. And throughout the report, the Sahel is only mentioned twice with the projection of ongoing terrorist activity and that, quote, a volatile mixture of intercommunal violence and terrorism will threaten West Africa's stability. 
And yet this kind of instability is given relatively low priority, even as the report emphasizes that quote unquote developing countries are experiencing ongoing humanitarian crises, surges in outward migration, collapsed governments and internal conflict. And so for me, a kind of important question emerges in, in this particular moment, which is how to reckon with very real instances of violence and actions that suggest a pivot in how foreign security actors view their activities in the region and the consequences of approximately two decades worth of counterterrorism projects, which have often exacerbated this violence. So I'll kind of quickly gloss some of the general history of these operations in the Sahel, provide some specific insights from my own research, and then end with what I think is on the horizon and what critically minded, politically engaged people, especially those based in the United States, should think about more in relation to the Sahel. So since the early 2000s across the Sahel, counterterrorism and policing initiatives have grown exponentially, led primarily by France, the European Union, the United States, and various United Nations agencies. These efforts have dramatically changed the scope and character of foreign engagement in the Sahel. In 2005, the U.S. government launched the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership, the TSCDP, which is a series of joint Department of, State, Department of State, U.S. Agency for International Development, and Department of Defense, Africa Command, AFRICOM programs, which again take up this, this language of partnership, which Smart rightly pointed to with countries in the Sahel, and they work to provide military and police trainings and surveillance and intelligence assistance. Similarly, the French Ministry of Defense launched operations Serval and Barkane in 2013 and 2014 respectively, deploying several thousand troops across the Sahel. So the most recent figure I saw was about 5,100 French troops. And the U.S. alone has spent an estimated $1 billion on the TSCTP, but as I noted earlier, these expenditures have correlated with an increase in regional insecurity in more violence. But also, and I think this is crucial in, in our framing of this present moment, those expenditures have also produced more pessimism about what such efforts can accomplish at multiple levels. So indeed, during field work that I conducted in the region between 2015 and 2019, and in interviews that I conducted with AFRICOM personnel in Stuttgart, Germany, which is where AFRICOM is headquartered, I was struck by the kinds of pessimism and resigned inevitability that I encountered and the long shadow cast by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think it's popular, especially amongst those of us on the US left, to think of a kind of hydraulic version of US empire, which kind of courses like liquid or a ventriloquist version of US empire. But these projects rely on and operate through local and regional security forces, the very same forces who, according to reports from the early 2000s, were seen both by outside commentators and local communities as the greatest threat to peace and security. And so now those very same actors are being tasked with being the defenders of peace with support from the US and EU countries. And the goal and kind of mantra of professionalizing these security forces persist even amid attempted and successful coups in the Sahel launched by local security forces, as well as the violence committed by those, those forces against civilians. And so if we want to think critically about the impacts of US military presence in the Sahel, we have to interrogate what kinds of curious foreign policy negotiations emerge, which draw together multiple actors in an effort to both preserve the counterterrorism status quo, but doing so in the face of low and lowering political will. So to think more about this, I want to return to an event from 2017 that Andam um, kind of presciently sort of flagged and think about its, its ongoing impact. So on October 4th, 2017, four members of the U.S. Army Special Forces team were killed alongside four Nigerian soldiers and one interpreter during an ambush in rural Niger near the Malian border. And according to ensuing international media coverage, the soldiers came under fire from fighters affiliated with the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. And during interviews I conducted with senior U.S. officials based in Niger at the time of the attack, they described the deaths of the U.S. soldiers as a watershed moment that illustrated the need for a, quote, robust U.S. security presence in the Sahel. But these deaths also prompted questions about what that presence should look like. Officials expressed concern that increased U.S. casualties would stymie whatever domestic political support for the American activities in the Sahel actually existed. 
And they also stressed that a lack of air cover and intelligence support made the soldiers more vulnerable. And they emphasized the importance of drone bases that had been built in northern Niger. So one operated by DOD, the other by the CIA. Um, and so even with the presence of drones with striking capabilities in the Sahel, the language of watching continues to animate so much of U.S. security policy there. In my interviews with military personnel at AFRICOM headquarters, they stressed the intelligence gathering and sharing role of the U.S., presenting it as more durable in contrast to France, which has more official boots on the ground. And so in so many ways, French policies are made possible in part through a U.S. surveillance apparatus and intelligence sharing arrangements. I also found it worth, worth noting that U.S. security officials repeatedly invoked the, quote, hard lessons learned in Afghanistan and Iraq, betraying an unwillingness of the U.S. government to commit additional large-scale military interventions. My informants stress the need to find alternate ways to advance the U.S.'s security interests without the liability of combat troops. So as one Sahel specialist explained it to me, and I, I come back to this, this quote again and again because it, it's still both perplexing and revealing, um, the Sahel specialist said, we can't do CENTCOM here, and Central Command is, is the, the combatant command that oversaw the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And this declaration declaration suggested that the specific characteristics of the region required different institutional approaches. Therefore, I, I see operations in the Sahel both currently and moving forward as a kind of test case for managing a deeply U.S. American imperial vision of a fundamentally insecure world without accruing the financial, political, and personnel costs of other wars. And so a vexing question remains. What kinds of institutional configurations can address very real instances of violence? And what fora can local communities both have their grievances heard and their needs addressed? And so the question prompts a, a series of kind of secondary questions. So is it the G5 Sahel, which is a regional security body headquartered in Mauritania? Is it ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, headquartered in Nigeria? Is it the African Union? Is it various UN agencies? And if not, what is left over. And I think the failures, either the sort of perceived or inflated or actual failures of these other entities provides legitimating cover for foreign militaries to continue to continue funneling money into these kinds of trainings. Um, so I describe this as a kind of pragmatism smuggled in through bad options. Military intervention becomes the least bad option out of a set of bad options. Um, and so I'll conclude with flagging an issue on the horizon that I think is important to think about, which is the nexus of climate change politics, liberal humanitarianism, and security projects. So Biden's Build Back Better, America is Back, and the strategic positioning of people like Antony Blinken, people who believe in the moral authority of the U.S. government on a global scale, is a challenging moment for progressives. I also think the quote unquote whole, gov whole of government approach to climate change that Biden has announced is also a moment for progressives to think critically about how we advocate and organize around questions of climate change. And to return briefly to the 2021 um, annual threat assessment, the section on climate change says that, you know, while climate change may threaten U.S. interests, um, with enough adaptation, the U.S. will actually be fine. But it's really, again, in the quote unquote developing world where we might see a quote increase for potential conflict over scarce resources. And I think there is an increasingly popular tendency to either implicitly or explicitly link climate change to conflict, even on the left. So I've heard this um, in relation to Syria, even a filmmaker and activist that I met during my time um, in the Sahel described an earlier project as attempting to get DOD to care about climate change, even as the US military, both in the present and historically has been a lead funder of environmental science and one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases. And I think there's something worrisome about that trend. Um, the environmental chaos, climate change chaos in Africa is actually a very old story. Um, and yet I would argue it's being reanimated by the diffuse security interventions normalized through the war on terror and demands that action 
any action be taken to address climate change. So this is where some of my, my more recent work is, is moving towards, which is about how environmental knowledge about the Sahel is actually deeply informed by the legacies and ongoing effects of the war on terror. So I look forward to the conversation and I'll, I'll end my comments there. Thank you so much, Brittany, um, for that overview about a lot of different topics that certainly we'll talk uh, more in depth about throughout this conversation. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, Blinken, you know, I actually think it's instructive for folks who maybe haven't seen uh, Blinken's statement at the G5 Sahel Summit to really check it out. Um, it's a quick, uh, quick watch on YouTube. So continuing on, we're going to go to Alex Thurston, who is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, he's the author of three books, most recently, Jihadists of North Africa and the Sahel, Local Politics and Rebel Groups, uh, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. And I recommend everyone pick it up, right? You, it's, it's a great read. Um, so we're going to move on to Alex and uh, looking forward to, again, being in conversation with you. Thanks a lot, Anam, for the introduction. And thanks a lot to my, my co-panelists. You know, really excited to be here and grateful to be here with, with everybody to talk about, you know, really important topics. Um, I think, you know, as, as Brittany pointed out, right, there's all sorts of interventions in the, in the Sahel, you know, with, with France in many ways in the lead in, in terms of, you know, deployments and so forth. And then the U.S. in this support role, it, you know, has increasingly seemed to me that there's just a lot of uh, contradiction and, and, you know, even sort of, uh, dishonesty in the way that that French thinkers, you know, present the situation and, and you know, areas that they that they seem to to really not want to deal with, right, you know, or, or to be explicit about and, and that the US rhetoric sometimes mirrors that to an extent. So, you know, the French presence is predicated on the idea that it's going to facilitate political progress, that it's going to facilitate what, you know, French backed institutions have referred to as the as the return of the state. Um, there's a number of problems with this, though. One is that the state itself seems to be a, a key problem, a key driver of violence, that state security forces, you know, as my co-panelist mentioned, are sometimes the authors of violence against civilians, you know, and as, as Brittany mentioned, if we're on track for the most violent year in the region, that's not all jihadist violence, that's also coming from state security forces, from, you know, civilian vigilantes and so forth. Um, then, you know, it's not just that there's state violence, but that there's also a substantial amount of authoritarianism across the region. Uh, and that's true for both the countries that are at the, the sort of core of the conflict. So Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger. And it's also true for Mauritania and Chad. So, you know, to start with Mauritania and Chad, uh, you know, both both countries have you know, essentially been under military rule for a lot of the past decades. In Mauritania, you have civilian leaders, but but really, you know, retired generals basically having run the state, you know, since uh, 1978 with, with brief exceptions. And then in the current mode, you know, running the state since 2008. Um, in Chad, you've had Idris Deby, who took power in 1990 in power since then, and, and you know, poised to win a sixth term in very, very lopsided elections, you know, and Chad and Mauritania then are sort of understood, you know, sometimes in the, you know, imaginative geographies of, of US and French policymakers as like the stable ones, you know, but obviously Paris and Washington are willing to make a lot of compromises with, you know, serious, serious authoritarianism and, and you know, crackdowns on dissent, again, you know, uh, seemingly very uneven playing fields for elections and so forth. When we get to the three, you know, countries at the core of the conflict, so again, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, there we have, you know, real sort of forms of civilian authoritarianism. So, you know, not not generals in uniform, but still, you know, um, in Niger, there's been, you know, real, real limitations on uh, opposition politicians campaigning. So in the 2016 election, the main opposition candidate was detained for the course of the campaign. This year, that politician was not allowed to contest the elections. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, again, like the French and American thinking seems to be predicated on, okay, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll sort of kill terrorists, we'll kill bad guys until political progress is enabled. But then at the same time, there's a lot of French and American support for these, you know, forms of authoritarianism. 
then two, you know, uh, in my view, a fair amount of American and French tolerance for for human rights abuses. You know, so when you have, you know, even from national human rights commissions of the conflict countries, you know, reporting on serious, serious military abuses, there's not much reaction, at least public official reaction from Paris or Washington or from, you know, other Western powers. Um, so, for example, in Niger, the National Human Rights Commission last year issued a report that said, you know, documenting basically, you know, over 100 seeming summary executions of civilians in the Western part of the country. Um, and the military, you know, the, the top, you know, ranks of the Nigerian military were openly sort of dismissive of those conclusions, not much follow up from civilians and not much kind of, you know, uh, attention from from the American or the French governments. Um, then two, there seems to be an expectation from Paris and Washington that Sahelian states can do a lot with a little. So, you know, when you look at the numbers for how many civil servants there are, for example, per thousand people, the numbers are really, really striking. You know, in, in France, it's something like 89 civil servants per every thousand inhabitants. In the Sahel, it's less than 10 per country. You know, even in Niger, I want to say off the top of my head, it's, it's three per thousand, right? So these are, you know, uh, severely, severely poor and resource resource strapped countries uh, then being asked to sort of, you know, step up governance or something, but with very, very limited resources. And then that the capacity of the state is further limited by neoliberal policies. So the, the effects of structural adjustment are still being felt from the 1980s and 1990s. And then there's continued pressure from, you know, the International Monetary Fund and others for states to uh, balance their budgets for states to, you know, uh, privatize state-run firms and so forth, and and to trim, you know, state bureaucracies. So, you know, the the kind of um, again return of the state or good governance or whatever, you know, Paris and Washington want to refer to it as seems pretty remote. You know, it seems hard to imagine how very very poor countries with minimal accountability for leadership at the top. Uh, are going to be able to, you know, to uh, to achieve kind of, yeah, this return of the state or this good governance. Um, then to the, the sort of war on terror paradigm seems to really constrain political space in the region. Um, there's been a, a gap, which is maybe starting to narrow a little bit, but which is still pretty stark between, you know, French policymakers on the one hand and Sahelian policymakers on the other hand. Uh, particularly in terms of the issue of negotiating with jihadists. So in Mali, since 2017, at the Conference of National Understanding, there's been formal proposals on the table to negotiate with the Malian leadership of, of JNIM, the main sort of jihadist movement in, in Mali. Um, both, you know, Iara Ghali, who's from northern Mali, and Amadou Kufa, who's from central Mali, key leaders within JNIM, both of them are... Malian citizens. And so there's been kind of a recurring suggestion, you know, and not everybody in the Malian elite obviously is on the same page, but recurring suggestions from the Malian elite to, to negotiate with these figures. Um, and there seems to be some willingness. The, you know, the question of negotiations is really fraught. What, what could be negotiated? Could the jihadists be trusted to, you know, to fulfill their end of the bargain? Um, how far would the Malian state have to go in terms of compromising on secularism and so forth? There's a lot of, you know, really, really tricky questions there, but there also seems to be, you know, a lot of support for this idea. And then there are across, you know, or different parts of central Mali, um, northern Burkina Faso, there are periodic local level agreements. Uh, so there seems, to, you know, between jihadists and different communities or different elites. There's, so there seems to be a kind of an appetite for peace uh, through negotiations, or at least for experimenting with it. But there's from the French side, you know, a lot of explicit rhetoric to the effect of no negotiations are possible. Uh, this is a black and white conflict. You know, you have the sort of terrorists on one side, the legitimate actors on the other. So this kind of war on terror paradigm, you know, really starts to kind of uh, constrain, I think, political space and, and either, you know, inhibit what's possible in terms of dialogue or sort of push dialogues more into the shadows where where then you know there's even less transparency for for Sahelian publics um maybe you know just to to wrap up i think 
you know, one other thing about the U.S. role is, is you have all this logistical support and, you know, but then there's also, as came up with the, the you know, Tongo Tongo incident in Niger, which has come up a couple of times, just this opacity I find about what the U.S. presence really is, you know, and all these kinds of layers of euphemisms, you know, Brittany may, may know, you know, better than me, but you have all these euphemisms from AFRICOM you know, uh, advise and assist and accompany, right? You know, the, the idea that American soldiers are, are involved, you know, maybe even up to the moment of combat, but not in combat, right? And I, I think it must go beyond that, right? Because what came out with, with Tongo Tongo and with various other things seems to indicate that sometimes U.S. troops are, are actively on patrols where combat is very likely and where these kind of, you know, rhetorical distinctions between advise and accompany and actual combat may collapse in practice. So, and then looking at, you know, TSTTP, this Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership, a lot of the funds are administered through contractors, um, you know, government, even, you know, inspector general reports, government accountability office reports have, have noted the TSCTP is unable to account for, you know, a significant amount of the money. So, you know, what exactly these contractors are doing, what, what you know, yeah, how the money is really working, how the training and so forth is really working, I find really, really opaque. Um, and I think that's a huge problem, of course, for the American public and also for Sahelian publics. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Alex, um, as well as Brittany and Smar for your opening comments and remarks. Um, we're going to have a discussion right now over some questions. And I strongly urge everyone in the audience to certainly put some questions on YouTube um, into the comments. We will answer those questions during the last uh, and final half hour. If you're just joining us um, with this first question, we'll sort of review a little bit some of the things that we've briefly touched on. Um, if, if all of the panelists could just for in, in a quick, you know, one minute answer, if you can just touch on the ways in which Western imperialism has contributed to and exacerbated conflict. So again, for folks who are just tuning in, this can be sort of like a refresher if you missed the opening comments. But again, how is Western imperialism um, uh, militarized the Sahel in East Africa and contributed to conflict. Uh, Samar, we could start with you. We go in the same order for this for this round. Sure. So, I think it's now been um, pretty widely documented that there has been a spike in violence and conflict across the continent ever since the rise of Africa. There's a direct correlation with the growing presence of U.S. military on the continent and the rise in violence. And this absolutely um, applies to the case of Somalia, where prior to the intervention, we didn't have something that exists in the form that it does today called al-Shabaab, right? It was, it was a direct reaction to the invasion in 2006 that um, the Union of Islamic Courts in Somalia fell apart and that the folks who um, were quote unquote more moderate had to flee the country and the more extremist version of what is now al-Shabaab came to the fore. So direct consequence of invasion and now 14 to 15 years of military occupation. Um, I do want to speak to the role of other powers in the region because I think that it's actually partly in dialogue with uh, and a response to the, to the rise of other powers that the U.S. is kind of panicking. And I think we have to account for the potential that uh, U.S. power in the foreign is actually on, um, on the decline. So uh, despite the fact that the U.S. controls uh, the vast majority of the world's foreign military bases, it's facing stiff competition in the foreign where political leaders in the region are realizing that there's money to be made by renting out public land for foreign military bases. This is especially true in Djibouti, which hosts more foreign military bases than any other country. Uh, they host China, Japan, France, Italy, the US, the European Union. Uh, the UAE has bases in Somaliland and Eritrea. Turkey has set up its largest foreign military presence in Mogadishu. Russia has initiated talks with the leadership in Somaliland and Eritrea. And um, as I just mentioned a moment ago, I think we need to allow for the possibility that the U.S. is panicking and, and for the potential that the spike in drone strikes that occurred under Trump were a reaction and, and kind of a form of panic, right? That we simply don't have the ability to uh, 
um, benefit from the kinds of negotiations and agreements that are taking place on the ground because the U.S. doesn't have the same presence on the ground in each of these countries in the, in the way that other countries increasingly do, like places like Turkey, the UAE, etc. cetera. Um, I, I think um, in Somalia in particular, we need to account for the role of UAE and Qatar because they have been providing arms to rival factions within the country. So that has been exacerbating divisions within the country. And of course, we need to account for the role of private security companies, um, which are often easily overlooked. But uh, with the, um, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When the UN effectively um, got rid of the ban on arms, to Somalia by setting up the peacekeeping operation that opened up a window for all kinds of private security companies to be bringing in arms ostensibly in the name of training the Somali police and the Somali military. So they too have been contributing to instability. And I think just to build on that, I think at the most basic level, a kind of increase in foreign military presence, um, especially in the Sahel, is a great recruitment tool. Um, and so I recall just kind of walking through um, Wagadugu, the capital of Burkina Faso, and seeing sort of graffiti saying, you know, American military get out of Burkina Faso as early as 2015, 2016. So there's a way that just the kind of buildup and the kind of presence, even if that presence is kind of disavowed as we're just training, I think in and of itself can actually um, provoke a certain level of, of animosity, but I also think that there's a way that a kind of state that is seen, I, I think, you know, we need to think complexly about states, um, especially in this region, but the ways that a kind of state is seen to not be responding to the needs of its citizens, and then for it to be receiving quite a deal of money to kind of build up its security forces is also a, a driver of, of both animosity, but I also think armed resistance. So I think in those kind of two direct ways, there's a way that both the kind of just the mere presence, but also a disincentivizing certain kinds of services from the state through a kind of investment in, in military expenditures is, is one of the, the drivers of, of ongoing armed conflict. Yeah, to that I would add that I mean, there's a lot to say about French imperialism in the Sahel, right? I mean, we could we could take that history back for for a long time. I mean, I think that you know, just to pick one moment, I guess. So there was a summit in a town called Po in France in 2020, um, where Macron basically invited the Sahelian leaders to come. And I mean, the the way that I read the optics, and I I don't think I'm alone in this, is that you know he he wanted them to sort of publicly ask for the French presence and to publicly sort of, you know, defer to him almost, you know, and, and to, to say, you know, we, we, we do want your continued presence in our countries. And, you know, that, that that was meant, you know, that seemed to be Macron and the French government feeling a little nervous about some of the expressions of anti-French sentiment in, in Mali and in Burkina and so forth. Um, and then there was a really good analysis uh, by Henny Nasebia at the, at the ACLED, you know, project about how it seemed that, you know, Sahelian security force abuses against civilians went up after Po, right, after this summit, as, as the pressure had upped for sort of results. And it's so easy, you know, I think for, for different governments to think, okay, the ultimate results are body counts, right? And so, you know, that, that there seemed to be a correlation between the, the pressure put on Sahelian heads of state at the Po summit and then, you know, the the, the spike in, in abuses against civilians. The U.S. role, I think, is, is you know, again, this more kind of support role, but, um, you know, the, the intensive emphasis on training, the, 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 the repeated descriptions of, you know, the Sahel is just one front among many in the war on terror. I mean, I, I think this has a big effect on, on you know, how people conceive of the conflict. Thank you, Alex, and, and thank you, Brittany and Samara. You know, just with your last point, Alex, continuing off of that, I, how, what do we think then about like what a progressive U.S. foreign policy in the region would look like? Um, you, you know, you, you mentioned sort of the perception that people have. Brittany really painted that picture like on the streets of, of uh, in Burkina Faso. 
So what would a progressive U.S. foreign policy look like moving forward, especially with, with the Biden administration and considering some of uh, Secretary Blinken's comments? It's open, yeah. yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that first, I guess, then. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, to me, I think it would start with with cutting some things, right? So cutting this Trans-Sahara counterterrorism partnership, you know, scaling back on on the support to the French, you know, um, you know, really looking for for you know nonviolent solutions, supporting dialogue, you know, to see where where dialogue would go um, between Saudi states and and the jihadists. Um, I think more you know humanitarian assistance, right? You know USAID and others provide humanitarian assistance, but I think that you know you have over a million people displaced in Burkina. You have you know ongoing issues of food insecurity and so forth. So there's there's a lot you know more to be you know, done there. I think then too, you know, that that neoliberal paradigms of what the state should be are not working for the region. I mean, they're not working for the world, but they're not working for this region in particular. And I think, you know, pressure on the the bank, on the IMF to 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 reverse some of this thinking about, you know, the the lean, budgetarily balanced state with no state-owned enterprises. I mean that, you know, I think more you know, we're at a DSA event, right? More, more socialism, right? More, you know, more public sector employment, more services, more, you know, more of a nonviolent presence of the state in people's lives. That, that's more the direction I'd like to see U.S. policy go in. I'll kind of say that I, I appreciate Alex's kind of emphasis on some of the more pr pragmatic aspects of this, because um, a progressive U.S. foreign policy is something that I have been sort of racked by thinking about since, you know, I was in high school and sort of seeing the war in Iraq. And yet one of the things that kind of sticks with me from field work that, that really, I think, um, continues to haunt me is it was a kind of joint event with USAID and the Department of Defense. Um, and they were sort of announcing a new kind of integrated strategy that they were working on to kind of streamline their efforts. And then I kind of raised my hand and asked, you know, a seemingly naive question about, well, you know, doesn't, wouldn't it seem that sort of U.S. AIDS policy in the Sahel might look a little different from DODs, and aren't there some some tensions there? And that, that policy, and the U.S. AID representative shot back and said, "There's there's no inconsistencies there because we are all working in the service of U.S. interests." And I was like, "Oh, um, so I I wonder what it kind of means." And and one of the reasons I ended on this question of liberal humanitarianism, I I also wonder about the ways, given the kind of entrenched um, humanitarian infrastructure in the Sahel how those types of um, investments also kind of support militarism or also support um, a sense of disaffection for local communities. And so I, I continue to be kind of uncertain about what, what kind of a progressive, what kinds of progressive institutional configurations can actually respond to what's going on. Thanks for that, Brittany. Samar, if I could combine two things, just, you know, uh, sorry to interject, you know, because we, Earlier on in the year, we heard about U.S. Uh, troop withdrawal from from Somalia, um, and just what was it yesterday? Somalia's President Farmajo announced now he's extending his term for another two years. Uh, U.S. and EU were saying that they're threatening sanctions. So I sort of want to combine the question into the the next two questions into one: What is the U.S. presence in Somalia going to be looking like moving forward? And then on the flip side. What can Somalia as a state and what can African states do to deal with, you know, the violence um, that they're dealing with within their borders, but also in the sense of contesting um, Western and, and Western imperialism and also the militarism of nearby actors? Thanks. And um, I think um, it's a lot of questions, but I'm going to try to take them on. And I'll, I want to build off of some of the points Brittany was making, and I think I'll tie them into these questions because this question of liberal humanitarianism is incredibly important. I think it is much too easy for us to focus on the more obvious actors in the form of AFRICOM and much harder to keep our eyes on uh, the, the more liberal, benign seeming entities like Amazon. And that's why I spoke about Amazon because it is, you know, it's a peacekeeping operation, right? How can you, you know, how can you possibly have a problem with a peacekeeping operation? When you actually look at the at the language, you come to realize that it actually has nothing to do with protecting civilians, and that's what's one of the most striking things about it. The purpose of the operation was to 
maintain the newly installed Somali government that was put in place after the invasion in 2006. And um, to come to your questions that you're raising, Andom, um, about the Somali government today, I think what we have been seeing for the last 15 years and are likely to continue to see is uh, uh, what one Somali analyst refers to as an endless process of transitioning out of transition. So, you know, we're going to see consistent invocation that the Somali government is, quote, not yet ready to run the government on its own. And on that basis that it is, quote, not yet ready, we will have the basis for continued military occupation and other forms of intervention. Now, um, as far as U.S. troop withdrawal is concerned, officially speaking, U.S. troops have been removed from Somalia, but I have heard um, on Twitter, indications that there are still some troops on the ground or that they're coming back, you know, most likely for for targeted operations. Um, so they may be kind of coming and going. And the U.S. can still claim that they don't have a formal kind of long term presence. As far as uh, other African governments are concerned, I think we have to account for the reality that many of these governments are already entangled in these very dynamics. And that's why an entity like Amazon really forces us to think about uh, the complicity of African governments. You know, that many of them pretend that they stand outside of the violence when in fact they're actively um, contributing to it. And Kenya is a perfect example of this. Um, if you recall over the years, and I think even again, this is coming back into the news that they're threatening to shut down their refugee camps in the name of security, right? Um, that they have put some, quite a bit of money into building a wall and a fence along the Kenya-Somali border. Um, and all of this, despite the fact that the Kenyan military is actively contributing to the very displacement that it seeks to protect itself from, right? This, this flow of people into the country. Um, and finally, many of these governments themselves are engaged in coordinated forms of cross-border policing, right, that are contributing to the very kinds of abuses um, that we're describing. Now, one point I want to make is the importance of attending to earlier imperial histories and how they inform the current moment. What we often think of and refer to as, as militarization today as though it's something new, that's connected to the rise of AFRICOM is inextricably linked to colonial era counterinsurgency strategies. So when we talk of the Kenyan security apparatus, apparatus, for example, it was never entirely decolonized, right? It is fundamentally shaped by colonial era logics um, and longstanding relationships. So we can see, you know, whether it is a direct line or not is another matter, but continuity between uh, the British involvement in setting up the Kenyan police and Kenyan military during the colonial era and then ongoing police trainings uh, from both, you know, the Brits and the Americans in places like Kenya today. Thank you, Samar. Especially, you know, that those that last point that you made is super important. And you know, there's so much that we need to interrogate. And I also just want to go back to what you mentioned about peacekeeping because when I was reading your article, you know, I just had to pause at one point because I was like, oh, I like that, like that. Liberal governizing discourses of peacekeeping and the rule of law function to mask and depoliticize the realities of imperialism and war. And so, you know, peacekeeping is occupation. So uh, I really just love the way you put that. Thank you so much. Uh, Brittany, Brittany and Alex, what are your thoughts on how uh, African governments, particularly within the G5 Sahel, um, how can they deal with increasing violence within their borders? I guess I'll, I'll sort of go first while also attempting to kind of provincialize my own expertise um, and kind of say that I, I don't know if I feel entirely comfortable sort of positioning myself as somebody who would give advice to sort of local African governments. What I would say and, and what I think my work is attempting to do is really take seriously the complicities of those of us based in the United States. And I think that's something that I, I sort of come back to time and again. But I do, I think, to take up kind of Alex's point, this question about coming to the table with different actors, um, pursuing new types of peace negotiations, attempting to build more community-based kind of um, 
associations that are able to actually um, respond to violence. Um, I think there are kind of lessons from other conflicts, um, especially in West Africa, sort of thinking about sort of reconciliation commissions and demobilization efforts. Um, but again, I, th I think all of those things become limited when you have the kind of ongoing presence of foreign militaries that are really just in interested in kind of funneling money into sort of guns and training as the solution to the problem. So I actually think there needs to be a kind of holding to account of the actions of France and the United States to say, actually, the policies you're pursuing are making it so much more difficult for local governments to enter into conversations with local communities to actually resolve these, these issues. Yeah, I mean, this is a really, really tricky question. And yeah, as, uh, you know, Brittany's, Brittany's caution is well placed about sort of giving advice to African governments. I mean, it's, it's very, you know, tricky when, when those governments themselves are, are some of the main authors of violence within the conflict. And, and I think, you know, France and, and maybe the U.S. to some extent too trapped, I think, thinking where they, they see the states of the Sahel, you know, rightly as as fairly brittle. I mean, you know, in in coups, you know, even in you know in in the Malian rebellion of 2012, right? The, the state presence, you know, definitely in the peripheries of of the countries, the geographical peripheries of the countries, has proved very very thin and fragile. You know, but even at the center, you know, military coups often have have taken power with minimal resistance. Um, so I think the French get trapped in the thinking that if we leave, then these states will fall. But then the French presence itself makes the states more brittle, right? It, you know, it encourages violence. It, you know, uh, favors a certain type of politician coming to power, right? The sort of, you know, a politician oftentimes in, in more or less sort of a French mold, you know, somebody who was, a, a, you know, some kind of technocrat or banker in the 1980s. They entered politics in the 1990s when the political space opened up a little bit and they've been a career politician since then and they're fairly, you know, deferential to France. I mean, that's the basic sort of model of the Sahelian head of state at this point. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah, I think that I think that a withdrawal of French forces and so forth would open more space. But I think that, you know, how to how to build more accountability for Sahelian states is a key question. I wish that Washington would be quicker to to criticize, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a sensitivity there, of course, but I wish that Washington would be quicker to say, you know, summary executions of civilians are unacceptable, you know, the, the flawed elections are unacceptable and so forth. And, and yeah, less kind of, you know, blind acceptance of, of authoritarianism in the region. Thank you all. So we're going to move on now to the Q&A portion from the audience. Um, so thank you to everyone who's already submitted questions. If you still have a question, please submit it. Uh, we'll try to combine questions uh, in you know, the smoothest way possible um, to be able to answer to everyone. And I won't be posing five questions at once like I did to Samar. Um, so thank you again for the questions. Please submit them. The first question we have is from Ryan. Uh, and, and Ryan asks, as we push for demilitarizing Africa, should we worry about a power vacuum similar to what happened post-U.S. withdrawal in Iraq? Thank you, Ryan, for the question. I can jump in really quickly and just say, you know, kind of expanding upon some of the points I made a few minutes ago that uh, this, the notion of there being a power vacuum is typically the basis for continued military occupations. Um, that is certainly the case in Somalia. That was the basis on which, you know, the African Union peacekeeping operation was set up and uh, remains the basis to maintain the presence of foreign powers today. So I think that, um, you know, we need to be prepared just to, to pull out, you know, we need to end these endless wars and endless occupations. I mean, it's a similar argument that's made about calls to either reduce or completely defund the Department of Defense, right? That they, that if we do so, the world will be sort of so fundamentally insecure that it will bring misery to all four corners. And again, I kind of, in my comments, I frame that as a kind of deeply American imperial vision that says that the world, um, to kind of use Alex's comment, is 
very brittle, absent sort of a strong U.S. military presence. And again, as Samar kind of mentioned, it becomes this kind of cyclical reason given um, to not only not um, lessen these types of projects, but to actually expand them. Um, Yeah, I think that's really well said from from both of my co-panelists. I mean, I think that I think that the the burden of you know argument and proof should be on defenders of the status quo at this point. I mean, the you know Sahel gets more and more violent every year as there are more and more interventions. You know that that I think of course you know the things could be worse if if there was a withdrawal of the French presence or the U.S. presence, but but the situation is very very bad now. You know, and so the you know, arguing against, you know, comparing a really, really bad actual situation versus a hypothetical, right, I, I think in a way it doesn't make sense. Yeah, and connected to that question, uh, Alec asks around the, the conflict that's going on in, in the Sahel, but it can also connect to what's happening in Somalia, is the United States using these conflicts to build its presence in Africa for the long term? And then if they are, how are they doing so? So I guess I'm, I'm interested in the question of sort of long term and sort of U.S. presence. So do you mean kind of diplomatic presence? Do you mean sort of development presence? Do you mean, um, because I think, again, to kind of harken back to this idea that there's kind of multiplicity of actors, um, some of whom do not, um, are not officially affiliated with DOD, but may receive sort of funds from DOD. But I also am interested in sort of thinking about the ways that United Nations and different UN agencies actually become repositories for certain kinds of funding allocations that strengthen counterterrorism or preventing preventing violent extremism programs. So I think I, I would actually sort of ask, you know, given the kind of entrenched nature of this, what do we kind of mean by long term? Because in some ways that infrastructure is already there. It's just being sort of um, maybe mobilized in different ways to avoid some of the, the kind of criticism and some of the liabilities that come with these kind of more conventional um, sort of boots on the ground operations. Thank you, Brittany. So moving on, we have a, a question from Athena. What role is foreign, invest, foreign investment in the Sahel playing in exacerbating militarism? Um, also, shout out to Dr. Thurston. I'm a former student uh, at Miami University. <laughs> a, uh, a loud, a loud four-year-old just arrived uh, home. So, if you hear him in the background, then um, you know, please be indulgent. Um, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a great answer to that question, unfortunately. I mean, I think that would, that would be part of what I would, you know. Put under that basket of, of the opacity of the situation, right? I, I don't have, you know, a, a clear sense of how sort of, you know, private sector interests and, and U.S. militarism work work together. I mean, I think that U.S. you know corporate investment in the Sahel is pretty pretty minimal, right? And I, I know that there are definitely you know there's private security around some of the the you know mining sites and so forth. Um, I think I mean this partly goes to the last question that there's this kind of disconnect between some of the different competing paradigms in U.S. foreign policy right now. I mean, I think this is something that Brittany alluded to earlier, that there's, from the vantage point of great power competition, the Sahel is not really a main theater of that. But from the sort of war on terror mindset that analogizes the presumed experience of Afghanistan to all these other theaters, then the Sahel is like a potential, like, front line. Um, so I think in a way, like, U.S., you know, foreign policy is a little bit kind of um, self-contradictory in terms of how to categorize the Sahel. Thanks, Alex. And, and Samar, thinking now in, in the Horn, specifically in Somalia, how, how do you see folks on the ground, um, you know, identifying what the U.S. engagement is uh, uh, in the country? Like, do, is it something, and this is a question that we have from, from the audience, uh, is it something that they identify as imperialism, squabbles within the state? H how do they see what's going on? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I can speak to uh, folks that I've been in conversation with in Kenya, which is where I have done the bulk of my research. Um, and I think it is important to recognize that uh, those who 
are referring to these dynamics in the language of imperialism are few and far between. Um, the bulk of the focus of activists that I uh, spent time with in Kenya has been on the US trained Kenyan police, US and UK trained Kenyan police, who are the most visible kind of presence in people's day-to-day -day lives. And that is what people latch on to, right? So when a neighbor goes missing, um, and in some cases they may be just kidnapped in broad daylight by the Kenyan police, that you know, people are trying to kind of trace what happened to this person and they go to local police stations to ask questions. And they do in that context often uh, learn or they're just told by Kenyan police that they actually aren't the ones calling the shots and that they're receiving instructions from outside powers. Uh, and so it's in that context that the role of the US and the UK come to the fore and that prompts questions for people. They know that the that trainings are being provided, but now we're also hearing that directives are being issued. And so that's the context in which, you know, these kind of broader powers come to the fore and attain meaning for people. But as far as like concrete day-to-day -day activism, the focus is primarily on the police. And so I think we need to be able to, as we think about, um, the kinds of resistance that has already been taking place on the continent, one, to recognize it, right, that folks have been pushing back and resisting for years now and oftentimes at a heavy price. Um, in the Kenyan context, a lot of the people who have been accused of uh, and in many cases arrested for supposed ties to terrorism are those who have been the most outspoken critics of the war on terror itself. Um, so I think we have a lot to learn as folks in the U.S. from these activists and from the kind of mapping exercise that, exercises that they have been doing to trace the connections, right, from their own police and their own neighborhoods to these foreign powers. Thank you, Samar. Um, we have two questions from the audience that um, both sort of go together under the umbrella of climate change. So I'm going to try to pose both of them to Brittany if she can answer in any capacity um, that she feels comfortable. First from Thomas, uh, I'm curious, especially in the West African Sahel, how Western definitions of climate change and environmental precarity link into a Western imperial history of control slash definitions of a crisis prone region. Um, as well, we have a question from Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, who asked to what extent is the desire on the part of Western powers to keep options open for having access to natural resources behind actions happening in the name of the war on terror. Um, so <laughs> thank you, Brittany. I know that's a, a lot. Yeah, I think those are those are huge questions and I'm currently trying to write a book length <laughs> monograph to, to kind of answer them. Um, so I'll kind of say the, the longer Western imperial history. So one of the things that kind of strikes me most about the character of French empire in the lands that primarily constitute the contemporary Sahel is the ways that sort of the, the use of kind of environmental knowledge, this idea that there was something profoundly sort of unstable about this particular environmental configuration was often used to justify um, more robust military incursions. So what that often looked like is the fact that you need sort of more violent ways of waging war in a violent landscape. And I think that kind of story, that story that says that there's something both inherently dangerous about um, semi-arid and arid environments like the Sahel continues to animate into the presence. Um, and I'll kind of bracket that point and say that the threats posed by climate change to the African continent are indeed very real and very worrisome. Um, despite having the lowest per capita greenhouse gas emissions, the African continent is the place where some of the, the worst effects of climate change are already being felt, but also predicted to get worse. But I do think that sort of story about the kind of worsening environmental chaos to befall the African continent becomes a way of making these kinds of security preparations that the kind of two stories that I encountered both in, in kind of talking to US military officials, but also different UN officials is that two things are happening that there's a kind of increase in the variability of rainfall, which is driving people to migrate out. Um, so the, the climate refugee story um, that attends the Sahel is one of the things that, that I'm trying to unpack because I don't think it's as simple as that. But also that 
increased scarcity in resources will lead to conflicts between different types of producers. Um, so this gets couched as the kind of farmer herder conflict that we see more and more attached to the Sahel. And in fact, one of the things that struck me when I was doing interviews with folks based in Niger, they would say things like, well, actually, the threat posed by Boko Haram at this point is not even our concern as these kind of farmer herder conflicts, which are actually the new conflicts of the future. Right. So I I encourage us to be very sort of careful in how we use a kind of environmental catastrophism to kind of marshal support for climate change action, because that type of catastrophism actually emboldens certain types of securitized approaches, again, kind of smuggled in through a pragmatism. Well, if a bunch of people are going to be leaving, we need to invest in border security. Well, if a bunch of people are going to be fighting, we need to train local security forces so they can be ready for that. So I'm, I'm still trying to sort of find ways of both articulating a kind of progressive um, attention to the dangers of climate change in the Sahel in particular, while not also kind of capitulating to these these deeper imperial ideas about the kind of problems of this type of landscape. Brittany, thank you so much for that perspective. And everyone who's watching, that just means you have to queue up Brittany's book, get it on the list. Like whenever it comes out, you have to be ready to, to pick it up. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, you know, staying in the Sahel, Alex, before we had, you know, Samar speaking about uh, U.S. interests in the Horn, what what are France's aims in the Sahel? Well, you know, whether it's currency policy, different operations that have gone on, what, what do you see as their aims in the region? Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. And I mean, I think that, you know, one one point to note for, for starters would be that, you know, France is pretty profoundly mistrusted by a lot of the populations in the in the region. I mean, I've, you know, been in, in government offices in Bamako with people, you know, saying to me their sort of theories of the conflict that, that you know, in their view that France ginned up the conflict to, you know, to extract resources from Mali. I think that's, you know, that's not my own perspective, but I say that just to point out that, you know, there's a lot of mistrust for France. I think recently the French have seemed a bit ambivalent even about what they're doing in the Sahel, you know, that, that there's sort of, you know, the sense of, ah, maybe we'll pull some troops out, maybe we won't, you know, a little bit of kind of back and forth on things like that. And you have, you know, elections coming up in France. And so you have France, you know, domestic, you know, considerations about Macron, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the far right and so forth. Um, I think, you know, there's a sense I think there's a bit of kind of thinking similar to the U.S. and Afghanistan, I mean, or at least until recently, you know, the idea that, oh, we have to stay here because if we don't stay here, then it'll get worse. I think there's a sense that, you know, just stability across, you know, former French colonies is, is a core French interest. I think there's a little bit of, you know, at least a few talking points about the idea that, you know, oh, if we don't sort of contain jihadist terrorism within the Sahel, then there will be more attacks in France. That, though, is a pretty weak talking point because there haven't been any attacks by any of the jihadist actors in Northwest Africa on French soil since, you know, circa 1994, 1995. I mean, it's really, you know, in the present incarnation, none of the jihadist groups in the Sahel have, have directly attacked France or tried to. The, the attacks on French soil have come more from you know, connections with people trained in Yemen or elsewhere. And even then, you know, there's a bit of sort of question about how to attribute responsibility for all those in terms of, you know, is it more just on the, the individual actors themselves rather than foreign trainers? But in any case, the Sahel is not a direct threat to France. But I think they've gotten sort of trapped a bit in their own ideology and their own thinking about Sahelian stability, even though they themselves have become a part of the problem. Thank you, Alex. And so thinking about France's aims in the region, let's now go to um, to the Horn, Samar. What is the U.S., Horn in Kenya, what is the U.S., the UAE, Gulf states, Turkey, Russia, what do they get out of bases um, in the Horn of Africa and in Kenya? What do imperial or sub-imperial powers want in the region? Yeah, great question. So I think that... Um, the instability in Somalia is what provided the pretext for setting up a military presence for many of these countries. And once they're there, you know, they have people on the ground, um, then that, that presents openings for negotiating economic agreements, for example. Um, 
Some of the, I think, potential interests for many of these countries include access to land. Uh, this is especially the case for Gulf countries who are looking to secure land for um, growing food <laughs> to maintain their own um, access to food. Another is resources. Oil uh, in Somalia especially is of great interest to a lot of countries. Um, contracts, right? So the, the potential to secure a contract to provide training, whether it's for the police, whether it's for the military, whether it's for ex-government capacity building, you know, uh, whether it's logistics, the provision of supplies to any of these um, military bases, um, to NGOs, humanitarian organizations. And so the potential to secure contracts d depends on continued instability in and of itself, right? Because that's what keeps everything going financially. Um, the remittance economy is, it, it essentially represents an untapped flow of money that uh, the formal capitalist economy does not really have access to. When we, when we think about the Hawala financial networks, which are being very closely monitored in the name of the war on terror risks, security, et cetera, this is millions and millions of dollars that evade Western banking systems, right? And I know for a fact that the Kenyan uh, banks are very interested in setting up shop and probably already have in Somalia. So those are some of the things. And then finally, just the, you know, the strategic location of the Horn along the Indian Ocean um, as the site of global trade, I think is of interest to all. Thank you, Samar. And you know, thinking about how there are so many different actors existing in, in, in these spaces, what does it mean to talk about the state, right? We have, as, as Samar was just alluding to, uh, imperial actors, we have local actors, we have national actors, we have state and non-state actors um, intersecting to produce these conditions. So so what does it mean for us to talk about the state? I know we've talked touched on this a little bit uh, before, but um, just curious about your thoughts as this came from the audience. I think I, I can jump in. I think that I think that you know the Sahelian states are really pretty limited. I mean, there's variation, right? You know, the the state in Mauritania is stronger than the state in Mali, so forth. Um, but you know, the 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 amount of control that states have ever had over the geographical peripheries of their territories that's that's an open question. You know, and and as I mentioned before, you have this key phrase from France about the return of the state. But in some places, there wasn't much of a state presence to begin with. So, you know, in, in a way, talking about kind of the establishment of the state. Um, then the Sahelian state's sovereignty really seems limited to me by France. And, and to a great extent, you know, a great extent France, but also by other actors. Right? You know, I, I talked about the optic of kind of Macron seeming to insist on some public deference from Sahelian heads of state at, at the Po summit, you know, in, in 2020. Um, and I think, you know, in, in the actual conflict, right, you see moments of this, you know, the, the this weakness of the state presence. Um, there was a town, there is a town called Farabugu in, in central Mali, where you had a jihadist blockade of the town. The Malian military deployed to the town to sort of try to break the jihadist siege, but was only partly successful in that and is now, you know, at least possibly going to withdraw because of a deal brokered between, you know, locals and, and the jihadists. So, you know, the, the state often seems really, really, yeah, circumscribed in its presence. I can jump in, Brittany, unless you want to. <laughs> okay, I think I know who asked this question. So I'm gonna, let's see if I get at what they're, what I think is being asked here. Um, I think um, what's, what we're seeing is that it's, it becomes really hard to talk about like clearly delineated categories of something called the state, right? Precisely for the reasons that Alex, you're, you're mentioning, right? That we can't speak of a sovereign entity called Kenya today because there's so many different actors and powers that are at work. If we think about the ways in which the US and the UK are providing the funding and the training for the Kenyan security apparatus, what does it mean then to talk about a security apparatus that is quote unquote Kenyan, right? Um, and that I think is, it really does force us to think in more critical ways about this language of stateness. I think that that's, this question is trying to get at, right? 
um, and to think about the kind of like the forms of power that that really become so opaque in contexts like this because you ultimately don't really know who is in charge. <laughs> And that makes it all the harder to resist, right? Because you need to be able to pin, pinpoint um, who's making decisions in order to go and say like, okay, this has to change, right? Um, with that said, I think it's precisely in these contexts when things become so blurred that every entity, but states in particular, become more invested in projecting images of their stateness, right? To ensure that people continue to believe that there is this thing called the state that makes decisions on the behalf of its citizens, right? And what I have found to be most fascinating in the Kenyan context is that the war on al-Shabaab has provided a basis for the Kenyan government to project a particularly new um, idea about Kenya on the world stage, right? That we are peacemakers, we're committed, we're global leaders in this effort to promote and restore peace and security in a way that has actually been quite effective um, in cultivating a national, almost like a national sense of pride vis-a-vis um, -vis the so-called bad guys and the terrorists, right? And the amount of energy that goes into cultivating this, this um, nationalism is really important for us to think about when we're trying to make sense of what we're up against, right? Because again, it's not just the, uh, the military and the police and these kind of um, formal infrastructures that are, that are part of the problem. Right? We also have to think about the cultivation of public support in order to legitimize endless war. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, I swear I pressed it. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much, Samar, um, not only for telling me I'm muted, but also for your thoughtful remarks. You know, we're speaking about, uh, you know, the opacity of, of the state. Um, Alex, you were talking about the ability to broadcast power. I'm thinking, and then this question came from the audience, what then is the biggest obstacle um, in thinking about how to start the dialogue between armed groups and the government? Um, what what is preventing you know this dialogue from happening? Uh, assuming assuming it's something that even governments want to want to. I think in in the Sahel at least, I mean, there is dialogue ongoing. You know, there there are these sort of patchwork agreements. There are also ad hoc you know arrangements at the at the national level, right? So most you know most recently there was in October. Um, a prisoner exchange between the Malian government and the and JNM, the main jihadist faction. So there are dialogues ongoing, or at least limited sort of deals. But I think the question then is, can they sort of scale up into something more durable and and you know far-reaching in terms of an actual peace settlement? There, there's a ton of obstacles. I mean, you know, I mentioned I mentioned French attitudes. Um, there's also the question of you know. Uh, the political transition in Mali, right? You know, the, the, the government there is a transitional post-coup government that, that has a mandate that's set to expire in 2022 when there are elections. So there's a question of even their, you know, ability to, to speak for the Malian people. Um, then there's the issue of what would actually be negotiated, what would the deal look like, um, you know, and, and would the jihadists be trusted to follow through on it? So, yeah, on the one hand, there are some signs already that deals are possible, on the other hand, you know, this is still pretty uncharted territory. And I'll also quickly add one of the, the kind of things that came out of my research in Burkina Faso that continues to worry me is the way that certain kinds of local communities have been deputized as terror, terrorist killers. Um, so I remember sort of seeing um, kind of advertisements on TV and in the news about, you know, keep an eye out for the terrorists, the kind of um, assembling of these volunteer militias. I, I wonder about how you kind of unring that bell when it comes to negotiations, when you have kind of communities who see themselves and have defined themselves and organized themselves in opposition to sort of terrorist groups. How, how do you actually mediate that kind of obstacle? Um, and it's something that, that, that troubles me. And 
our final question uh, that we have from the audience, uh, especially important for those of us here um, in the States who are concerned about everything that we've discussed today. How can activists based in the U.S. build solidarity with those opposing imperialism and militarism on the African continent? And for this final question, we'll um, take uh, responses from everyone. Uh, if you could please keep your answers to one minute uh, and any other closing remarks uh, you want to make. Thanks. I'll jump in. Um, I haven't had the chance to mention it yet, but I do think it's important to think about the racialized labor that sustains the U.S. military and its operations on the continent. So on a day-to-day -day level, the folks who are staffing the military bases, who do the cooking, who do the cleaning, these people, many of these laborers have staged protests and shut down operations. For obvious reasons, these protests are not covered in the mainstream media, but they represent openings, I think, for further organizing. Um, I would just simply say that we in the U.S., we need to read and inform ourselves um, about what's going on. We need to learn from people who are most directly affected and to follow their lead as to what strategies to pursue. Yeah, so I will echo all of that. And my kind of pithy way of putting this is that we need to take responsibility for our own ignorance, be committed to our own political education, be honest about our own culpabilities, be suspicious of our own self-satisfaction and easy answers about imperialism past or present. But I also want to flag um, something that Ms. Serena el said in the previous um, sort of roundtable, which is understand the ways that activists on the ground are deeply suspicious and outright hostile to misguided solidarity efforts. Um, and in her term, that these can have a de-radicalizing effect. So, I mean, the question of, of organizing in general is who is already doing the work and how can I be of service? And I think that's an ongoing question that we have to ask ourselves. Yeah, I, I agree, you know, 110% with everything that my co-panelists said. I mean, for me, I think, you know, pushing back on some of the lazy journalism or, or, you know, insidious journalism that's out there, pushing back on some of the kind of think tank analyses that one sees in Washington. I mean, pushing back on certain framings of these conflicts, you know, overly sort of securitized and, you know, apocalyptic framings of these conflicts, I think can be one, one step. Um, but yeah, direct solidarity is a, is a real challenge. I mean, and I think there's, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, amazing organizations and so forth. And then, and then there's a lot of, you know, kind of um, civil society organizations that are set up to cater precisely to Western funding and so forth. So it's, I think it's very complicated actually for, for outsiders to navigate that and, and to assess the, the local sort of activist scene. Yeah, certainly. I mean, even just being part of the Eritrean diaspora with a familial genetic connection, I sometimes struggle with this uh, in its own right. Y'all, thank you so much. This was so informative. Um, it was so great to be in virtual space with you. Everyone who's in the audience, you have to follow uh, Brittany, Samar, Alex on Twitter. We have Sahel blog, Samar42, Brittany Mache. Follow them on Twitter. They're great follows. Purchase their books, those that have come out and have not yet come out, um, and be sure um, to keep them on your radar, just as we're keeping um, the entire continent, but particularly the Sahel and East Africa on our radar. Um, join DSA and thank you, Haymarket, Africa is a country, and everyone who's tuning in uh, for being part of this conversation with us. Appreciate y'all. Thank you for moderating. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>